Well, and like they say, I mean, that's how you feed two birds with one scone. What? That's how you feed two birds with one scone. No, they don't say that. It's it's kill two birds with one stone. Well, okay, but I think about it. If you had a scone, you could feed maybe three or four birds, five birds. How big? I don't know how big is the scone. So really, you're actually accomplishing more than if it was just killing two birds with one stone. So if you're feeding two birds with one scone with the potential... You know what? You're, you're not wrong. Okay. Let's just move on. Okay. All right. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to the Sights and Sirens Back to Basic podcast. Uh, we're excited to jump into drugs today. Yeah. Try them out. Yeah. Uh, no. So we're going to talk about pharmacology today. But first, I wanted to let you know who our sponsor is. We are sponsoring ourselves. So we want to tell you about our NREMT prep program. We have a great program with over 15 hours of video content, all based off of the um, educational standards from the NREMT to make sure we're hitting all the high yield stuff that you need to know for your exam. Uh, we actually, pretty exciting, have a 94% pass rate. So I think the national average for passing your NREMT is like 60 some percent, maybe up to 70, but uh, we're doing a little bit better than that, which is kind of exciting. We've had some, a lot of success with students. People are enjoying it. Uh, not only do you get access to the content, you get workbooks to go along with it uh, that you can download. You get a robust question bank that we now offer as well. Uh, so lots of really good stuff. We're really enjoying it. You get to see us every day if you want to. You can just watch us every I day. I know I do. Yeah. I right? stay in the program just to feed my ego. It's exactly. Great. Right. Perfect. So. No, if you, if you guys like this podcast, even a little bit. You should check out the program. It's a, it's a lot of fun. It, it's I think it's us at our best. So yeah. if you like this, it's more of this but better. Mm -hmm. So yeah. no, absolutely. Check it out. Have a good time. Get some studying done. Kill your registry. There that's, we go. That's the goal. That's right? the goal. Feed two birds with one scone. Nope. Uh, so nope. today we are talking about uh, pharmacology basics. So I, I want to get into a little bit, um, just about some definitions and some general concepts of pharmacology. Pharmacology, I think, is is a lot of times. Um, mislabeled as the most intimidating topic when it comes to EMT work and paramedicine, especially sure. like when you're transitioning from EMT to paramedic. They're like, all oh, the I know the pharmacology. Like I take a whole pharmacology class. Like it's this scary thing. But pharmacology, if we can understand some of the basic concepts with it, mm -hmm. and that's what we do, right? We bring things back to basics. If we can understand basic concepts like mechanism of action or bioavailability, or pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. Big fancy words. Sure. But if we understand how a drug works and what it does to do its job, we run into way less issues when we're doing treatments. I feel like this happens sometimes too, because like when people jump into pharmacology, I remember this in medical school when we jumped into pharmacology, all of a sudden you just start learning drugs, right? You start learning drugs. And I feel like this approach that we're going to try to take today, we're really kind of getting this bird's eye view of like, what pharmacology is and again some we like to define terms because that makes such a big difference if we can understand some of these generalized concepts it's then when you get into the each individual medications it makes a lot more sense because again if you're not if you just if i just start reading the name of a drug and tell you the mechanism of the like memorizing note cards it's like memorization that, versus, yeah yeah it's you know, hard application of yeah. concepts right so if we can understand the concepts and we can simplify them we're going to be a lot better at application. No one expects you to be able to memorize every drug, every adverse effect, every side effect, every mechanism. Like, it doesn't work that way. When you understand groups of medications and kind of how they do their job, then things start to get a little bit easier. So just to kind of break it down, it, if you were to open a pharmacology book right now, chapter one isn't going to be, hey, beta blockers. You know, it's, right. it's going to be, hey, what what is pharmacology? What's the study of pharmacology? Yeah. What are we looking at? How does a drug work? What's... Um, how, how is it metabolized in the body? How does metabolism work? And, and we break those things yeah, down. Yeah. So I'd like to kind of cover them today. One of the reasons, one of the inspiration I had for, for doing this topic, one is is we did a, a great live lecture in our program on it, and mm -hmm. I think it went really well. It, yeah. it really turned a lot of students on to it, and I think some light bulbs went up. So We're all about turning students on. Yep. Yeah, that's what we do. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> we... Uh, we're kind of starting a little bit of like a live lecture series going into pharmacology, and we started with this basic thing, and we just we, we saw some some light bulbs turn on and, and some people getting excited about that. So that was one reason. The other reason is I, on the job recently, we've, we've had a lot of kind of new people come through my department, but on the job recently in a training that I was hosting, we had a, uh, 
a newer paramedic, newer mm-hmm. guy, say something along the lines is, you know, I always mix up, you know, which type of epinephrine to use for which thing. Like, is it the one to 1,000 or is it the one to 10,000? Because we were talking about IV administration and they had said one to 1,000 instead of one to 10. Mm-hmm. That's a big mistake that you don't want to make in the field. Right, <laughs> we'll right, talk about right. why. But like, it is kind of hard when you just raw memorize. But if you can understand why we're putting a lower concentration of a med into the into the vessel because it's 100% bioavailable versus why it, it takes way more to inject and we, we're going to lose some through through metabolism. We're going to burn through it as it goes through the muscle before it gets to the veins. Now mm-hmm. we start to understand, oh, that makes sense. I'm never going to make that mistake. I understand that the veins, it's more, more potent in the veins because all that medication is going right to where it needs to as yeah, it goes yeah, yeah. working through. So it kind of clicked for me thinking, you know what, I think we need to kind of go into these concepts because then those mistakes aren't going to be made in the field. Sure. I think this is a good one too. Like I said, you might be listening to this driving in your car or on the job. And say, but if you have an opportunity, if you can grab a pen and paper, this probably isn't a bad episode. Just looking at what we're going to define here and some of the things we're going to get into. If you can stop, pause the audio, write down some of the, what we cover. Like I said, we're going to go over a lot of like good, solid definitions here and hopefully give you good understanding. So if you have that opportunity, it might be worth it. Yeah, for so. sure. For sure. All right, we'll jump in. So the first thing I want to talk about is is dose and response. Okay, so before we get there, we got to talk about just what desired effects are, what side effects are, and what adverse effects are. Because there's already a lot of, Mm, you know, miscommunication about that and people get confused. So we obviously know a desired effect of a medication is what we want it to do, right? What we're giving it for is a better way to say that. Because there are medications that maybe do several things. But we're using that medication because we want one of those. Mm-hmm. I'll give you an example. Um, epinephrine. When we're giving epinephrine or adrenaline in a cardiac arrest, we're using it for its agonist benefits to the heart, right? It, it, it increases cardiac contractility and, and hopefully gets a heart rate going. Mm-hmm. Well, what else does epinephrine do? It also opens up the airways, and that's why we can use an anaphylaxis. Well, it's it's not really the desired effect. We're not trying to open up the airways there, but it's something that's going to come along with it, right, right? right? So desired effects are always what we're giving the medication for. If I gave you epinephrine in an anaphylactic response, now I'm, I'm there's multiple desired effects. Mm-hmm. I'm looking for vasoconstriction. I'm looking for the the opening of the airway. Bronchial dilation, things. Yeah. But there's always, you know, if, if you give a... Uh, a bronchodilator that also has beta agonist effects and it increases the heart rate. When I give you albuterol, I'm not trying to raise your heart rate. I'm right. trying to open your airways up, mm-hmm. right? So desired effects are what we're giving the medication for. There are other effects that come along with that, and we would call those what? Side effects. And that's what you're describing. Like I said, like the big example here would be like uh, albuterol. Albuterol obviously is going to do bronchodilation. We're going to give it for someone who's you know having an asthma attack or a COPD. Well, as a side effect, it's also going to stimulate the heart to start beating faster. Now, we see this confused a lot because I've actually seen people come in and say, well, I have an allergy to albuterol. Or I, I've actually had people tell me they have an allergy to epinephrine, which would be really hard to do since your body makes <laughs> yeah. it. But I was like, well, what happens when you take epinephrine? They're like, oh, my heart starts racing. My heart. Like, okay, well, <laughs> again, like, this is not an allergy. This is not, you know, an allergy would be an adverse effect, right? right? This is a side effect, right? It's something that we expect to have. And that's the thing, too. I think side effects are things that we expect to happen. Maybe that's a good way to define yes. it as well. We expect them to happen. And if you don't know what the side effects are of medications, then you can get confused. Like, well, shoot, why is this person you know, feeling anxious and tachycardic, like maybe, maybe they're, you know, you got to know what the side effects are be, to be able to recognize that, Hey, it should be doing this. this yeah. And they, they don't always 100% happen. Like everybody's different. That's what's interesting about medicine, true, right? Yeah. Like some people might respond more to side effects of medications based on kind of mm-hmm. their receptors and how their body, how, how their balance is. But the bottom line is right. Side effect may be something that we don't really desire, but it is expected. Well, right? and it's interesting too because, like you said, you just said we'll use up epinephrine again. When you use epinephrine in cardiac arrest, we're trying to stimulate the heart tissue. That's our desire effect. The side effect in that case would be bronchodilation because it just does that, right? Which doesn't yeah. matter to us in CPR. But if we're using it in anaphylaxis, right? Well, I guess we're kind of using it for both, but we're using it in a different case. Maybe the side effect that was a side effect before is now our desired effect, and then the other thing is the side right. Effect. Like in you anaphylaxis, I mean? so, we don't necessarily want like heart contractility and heart rate to crank up. Right, we yeah. want vasoconstriction and, and bronchodilation. Right. So all of a sudden the, right? that so it's desired like, effect becomes the side effect and the side effect becomes right. that. But and it does both. A lot of pharmacology is looking at, okay, I have this chemical. It does these things. How can I get just the desired effects? How mm-hmm. can I limit the amount of side effects? And right. how can I prevent adverse effects from happening? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So before we go further, let's just an adverse effect 
is like the stuff that we don't really expect that can happen, but it, it should. Like an allergic right. reaction. Like an allergic an reaction effect. is considered an adverse effect, right? Right. So if I made a drug and it, it its design was to get you high, but it also made you vomit, that's, I have a desired effect. I have a side effect, right? Mm-hmm. If it sometimes kills 1% of the population, well, there's an adverse effect, right? It's not supposed right, to right. do those things. Yeah. So don't get too mixed up with it. You know, it, it is difficult to, to determine between side effect and adverse effect, but I think you hit the nail on the head. For the most part, the big difference is going to be expectation mm-hmm. um, versus... Because even in like, so like we see this sometimes with like, with people who use marijuana, like I said, people use it medicinally for, you know, for different things. And then you can get side effects with it. But you also can get a, a, a syndrome where people like have crazy vomiting, that, like which is a problem. You know what I mean? Like it's not something we're trying to do. It's not something that it, it becomes a big issue. This like hyperemesis syndrome. I would I would kind of label that as an adverse effect. Where like I guess it could also be a side effect, but like the adverse side comes into like one we don't we don't want it to be. It's happening. a negative effect on the body. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Right, right. So I might give you a medication that has a side effect that's technically a negative effect on you because mm-hmm. of how your body is or the disease state you're in. Right, but it's right. an expected outcome of the drug, so we call it a side effect. Yeah, so yeah. it's it's nuanced in definition, but for the most part, think adverse is always bad. Side effect is is sometimes expected, and, yeah, but yeah. it is expected, right? Yeah. Um, and this is where you know selecting selecting drugs gets gets interesting, right? That's why sometimes they think vasopressin versus epinephrine, or they you know we start to have discussions about is there a better medication, or is there mm-hmm. a medication that can do this better? Because we want to just try to only solve the problem, right, without messing with any other systems. That can be very difficult with chemicals that are in our body. Yeah, and we tried this a little bit with um, ketafol. So we took ketamine and we took propofol, and they both have different side effects. Um, which can become adverse effects if you're not careful with how you titrate them. And we thought, well, hey, if we t- put them together, maybe we can get more of the desired effect out of both of them and limit the side. It, it didn't really work. But, yeah. like, th- th- again, like the whole idea of pharmacology is trying to take medications and, and to optimize the desired effect and to lessen the side effects and obviously lessen the adverse effects. Yeah. Awesome. So that's one concept that I just, I just wanted to touch on right off the bat. The other concept that we need to understand is that Increasing the dose of a medication does not always increase the desired effects and or side effects and adverse effects, sure. right? So the more I give you doesn't necessarily mean the more response. Like there is a limit. It isn't it, like one is good, two is better. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't see, work that not, way. Yeah, yeah, more yeah. is better is not is not a rule of pharmacology, right? So there is an index that we're going for. There's a certain level that we want to get there to reach those desired effects. And if we exceed that, it's not gonna have any any benefit let's say okay let me give you a better example let's say uh i'm i'm trying to get 10 of jason's disco wafers in your in your system and that's what's going to get you high right like, taking do you, 20 do you have any of those disco wafers <laughs> yeah, right now yes. <laughs> uh, getting taking 20 of those taking 20 milligrams of that isn't going to get you more high right i bumped into this the other day we had a, a guy who was taking fentanyl mm. and uh you know, illegal use of recreational, you know, recreationally. Yeah. yeah. So, but he told me, he goes, yeah, I'm like, I'm really struggling with it. To be honest with you, it doesn't matter if I spend $15 or a hundred dollars on it. Like I'm going to take all of it. Cause I want to get as high as I possibly can. And it doesn't really work. Eventually mm. those receptors are bonded to, depending on what type of med, and we'll talk yeah, about yeah. the different uh, dynamics and, and kinetics of how, how these drugs work. But you know, more more isn't going to make you more high. Eventually, you've reached your limit, and you're just wasting the amount of medication yeah. that you're dumping into. Well, your and once you get outside of that therapeutic index, now you increase the chances of side effects and adverse effects Absolutely. and that sort of thing too. Um, again, like an you know an, a side effect slash adverse effect of certain medications is respiratory depressions. So like even like I said in that fentanyl example, like he, he's not necessarily increasing his his quote unquote that would be therapeutic, but you know I mean his quote unquote desired effect. He's he's but he is increasing his risk yeah, of, of right. that adverse of hey you snowed yeah. your respiratory drive, yeah you right? can't breathe right exactly so, so. um so yeah and th- this kind of transitions us into talking about like therapeutic concentrations in the vo- in the body right there is always with every medication an amount that won't produce the desired effect because it's not enough and there's an amount that won't produce the desired effect because it's too much so when we find that kind of in between phase that's our therapeutic index that's where okay i'm giving enough medication enough medication is in your system it's it's producing the desired effect 
how safe a drug is, and we, we'll get into this in a little bit, but like how safe a drug is, is usually how large that therapeutic index is, right? Because if the difference, if I give you five of Jason's disco wafers, five milligrams, that's going to get you, get you where you need to be. And you can go up to 20. Well, it's a relatively safe, safe drug. Five to 20, that's a, that's a bigger a big therapeutic range, index. Yeah. If, if 5.1 is going to kill you, and 4.9 isn't going to do anything for you, it's not a very safe drug, right? It's not a very effective right. drug. Right, and that's when we start talking about, like, a, you'll hear people talk about a narrow therapeutic index or a wide therapeutic index. And again, that therapeutic index is that, like I said, level of concentration of the medication that will give us our desired effect. And you have to remember, too, that every medication, essentially, outside of its therapeutic index, usually on the far side, right, can be a toxin, right? Anything right. becomes a toxin when you get, you know... Too much of a good, too much of anything is a bad thing. It's you know right. at some point, and we definitely see that in pharmacology where you've got these you know medications with narrow or wide therapeutic index. You know, an example like of a, a more narrow therapeutic index would be like Coumadin, right? Like we play with these numbers because if they gets too low, they're at risk of clotting. If it gets too high, they're at risk of bleeding. You're trying to play within this right. therapeutic index Make it and work. keep the concentration at a level that you want. Right. So. How we calculate this therapeutic index scientifically, just because you might bump into, if you're if you're out there studying, you might bump into test questions. This isn't necessarily super relative to us out in the field when we're working, but they usually take the effective dose 50%, and they, they take the lethal dose 50%, and they tr they subtract the former from the latter. So basically, they, they use animals, and they, let's say they use rats, right? And they give a bunch of Jason's disco wafers to rats. And once they get to the point where 50% of the rats are dying, they call that the lethal dose 50. And then they give a bunch of disco wafers to rats and they see when 50% are getting the desired effect, they're high as a kite. They call that the effective dose 50. They take that lethal dose, they subtract the effective dose, and that's where we usually call the therapeutic index. So that's how it's kind of calculated. Um, so you just might bump into questions yeah, about yeah, that yeah. If, if you're a, if you're a student. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing too is like like talking about therapeutic index. I mean, there are still some medications. I feel like in certain um, situations where we still don't really know what the therapy like. And the one that comes to mind is epinephrine and cardiac arrest. Like we still we we, we use one milligram, right? Like. There are still studies going. I mean, back back in the day, they were using two, three, they four, were doing five stacking doses. They were stacking yeah. doses of epinephrine. Now there's research going on looking at lower doses, stacking doses again. Like we don't really know what that therapeutic index is for epinephrine and cardiac arrest. So, like I said, you may run into that too. There are certain aspects where, like, this is how much you give, and it's just because we decided that we don't know yet what the therapeutic index might be of that medication. Right. Right. And these are all things just to kind of bring it back to, to make you understand why we're covering this. These are all things that need to play up in your mind when you're when you're on scene that you're using a medication. If I'm going to give a patient fentanyl, my desired effect is to reduce that patient's pain or eliminate that pain if I can. Right. I need to understand that a side effect of fentanyl technically is is a, a lowered respiratory drive. We mm -hmm. can we can destroy the respiratory drive if we give certain amounts. Right. I know that fentanyl does does have a somewhat narrow therapeutic range. So if I mess this up by five or six milligrams, I could also they could be passed out, right? Understanding these things and kind of having an idea of familiarity with the drug helps us helps us treat and helps us treat yeah. effectively. And I think people need to keep this in mind too. Just because the we're talking about like definition of terms, therapeutic index. Therapeutic index is not the dose. Like your therapeutic index is not the recommended dose of a medication. So right. if my therapeutic index for fentanyl is like two milligrams to ten milligrams. It doesn't mean that you can just give ten milligrams off the bat and be like, hey, hey. I mean, like we have protocols, we have things in right. place. Like the 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 recommended dose is going to try to put you in the middle so that you're in the middle of that therapy. You don't really want to be on either end of the therapeutic index. You definitely don't want to be beyond those you know, right. those ends. And so. conservative doses are given to you for the most part, and they fall within the yeah. therapeutic index in non dangerous areas, which right. is great. But Having an understanding, I'm not saying be scared of fentanyl or you yeah, have yeah, to know yeah. all these things. What I'm saying is n know what your drug does. I know that this relieves pain, but I also know that it can it can hurt the respiratory drive. Guess what I'm going to have ready to go with me, whether I'm given a little bit of fentanyl or a lot of fentanyl. I'm going to have my intubation kit mm -hmm. and stuff ready. Yeah, I'm yeah, going to yeah. have oxygen ready to go. I'm going to be prepared with a bag in case. And I'm going to maybe have a reversal agent if we have that if available a, too, right? So one, like yeah. in this case, we could use Narcan because it is an opiate. Right, but, right. you know, sometimes we don't have a reversal agent. So these are just things that we need to consider as medical providers as we go in, as we approach pharmacology in general. Mm -hmm. 
Um, last thing I kind of want to talk about in terms of dose and response is efficacy versus potency. You hear this a lot. Oh, that's such a potent drug. Or, you know, you don't really hear people say like, oh, this it's is very a, efficacious. This, is, <laughs> well, this drug is very know, is efficacious. Yeah, it is. I just thought it's of it. That's efficacious. why I had to say it. I like it. You sound smart. Yeah. yeah, you are smart. Thank you. Doctor. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, so efficacy is, is how good a drug is at doing something. And potency is how much you need to get it done. Okay. So, um, did you have an example? Like, I, what would be a good example of? Like, a lot of times I hear like dopamine versus, or I'm sorry, um, I use like morphine versus fentanyl, right? Uh, fentanyl tends to be more potent, right? It doesn't mm, take yeah, as yeah. much fentanyl to get the job done with pain mm-hmm, elimination. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It takes a little bit uh, more morphine a lot of times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah. Right. I mean, again, pot- potency is basically like said. If something is very potent, it means that it takes a little bit to get the desired effect. Whereas something that's not very potent would take a lot to try to get or more comparatively more comparatively to something that's you know more or less potent that sort of thing you know efficacy is more basically like 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 you said does the does the drug do a good job at what which like i would kind of argue that any of the medications you're using are efficacious well yeah we pick efficacious yeah that's the only ones that we that's the ones we use there are medications out there that are just not i'm trying to think of an example Like, like, like why you might decide to give coumadin over another uh, you know, an, another blood thinner or something like that. You know, it, d- it depends on how... Well, uh, one example here would be antibiotics. Like I said, well, you guys don't do this in the field, but antibiotics, like there are certain a- antibiotics that are very efficacious, like they, they, like they, like in terms of treating a certain infection and other ones that are not. They're not like... So example, like right now, um, we see like ciprofloxacin, so an antibiotic cipro. It doesn't do a great job in, you know, in the United States of treating UTI in women versus another antibiotic because there's some resistance. So that would be like an efficacy. Like yeah. that, we're talk- that's what we're kind of talking about when we talk about efficacy. But I like, think we lump them together, like at least from like a basic provider standpoint, I think when we're coming through school and we're, we, we lump them together, we go like, oh, this is the strong stuff. Like yeah, this yeah, must yeah, be yeah. the best stuff. And it's like, no, 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 no. Like, no just because yeah, yeah, it's yeah. potent doesn't mean it's actually good at its job. Right, right, right. right. So, and we need to be careful you know, if we were in, in this decision-making, you know, they they have to be careful when they decide what kind of meds we're going to use based on potency and efficacy. Well, so you may, yeah. you may choose, if you're going to prescribe a medication to someone, you might have one that's more efficacious. I'm using this word all the time yeah, now. Yeah, just keep using you it. You may have, it's going to be wrong, but someone's going <laughs> to check us. So, but you may use one that's more efficacious, but if that takes an unreasonable, they have to take that six times a day because it's Mm -hmm. not very potent. Mm -hmm. It might not be best for what's the lifestyle of that patient, right? right? So you might go with a less efficacious drug that has a little bit more potency because it's going to last longer for them. It's going to be easier for them to take, you know what I mean? So it it all depends on those factors. Yeah. And another example would be too, like you consider like morphine, fentanyl to be very potent pain medications, right? right? But in kidney stones, a lot of times we find that they don't do a good job, like an anti-inflammatory, like a Toradol or something like that actually does a... it's that's more efficacious in that in that yeah. state. You know what I mean? So yeah. that the, and again, these are the things we're taking into consideration when we're trying to figure out what's going to be the best medication for our patient and for our patient's current condition. So yeah, please don't write in and be like, "Listen, I diverted from protocol because I feel that right. this drug right. is too potent or not efficacious enough." Right? Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> that's not what exactly. we're trying to get. Right, at. Right. We're just trying to teach you these general concepts to help kind of enhance. Uh, your skills out there yeah. and enhance and it helps your, you understand your critical why, thinking. Yeah, it know? helps you understand why certain drugs are put in certain protocols. It, it helps you understand why we, you know, some medications are not recommended for certain conditions. And because you, because you're, we're, we're playing with and through trial and error over the years, we've figured out which medications work best in which situations exactly. based on these concepts. Exactly. So the next thing we, we've kind of talked about dose and response. The next thing I want to talk about is route, and this directly affects it. So. The route that we choose for a medication, explain to me why I would choose an IM route versus an IV route or, uh, you know, what, what what factors play into that? Sure. So there's, I mean, there's a couple of different things. So like one is what route can you give it in, right? I mean, that's a lot of times too. Like if I can't get an IV, I might look for an IM, you know, yeah. spot or an IO or something like that. Um, if someone's got a compromised airway, I'm not going to give oral medications. I'm going to give IV. But also onset. You know what I mean? So, and that's something we're kind of talking about a little bit now too. Like there are certain things that my body has to do with an oral medication before it enters my bloodstream. Eventually it gets in my bloodstream. That's where it needs to be to get to the receptors it needs to go. Same with an intermuscular injection. Sometimes I want that effect to happen quickly. So I maybe will go an IV route, right? Like someone who's in excruciating pain in the emergency department, I'm going to put an IV in and I'm going to give them IV pain medicine. Now, when they're treating more mild pain at home, 
I don't really want them to get that effect super quick onset. I want that to be kind of prolonged over a period of time to help yeah, better maybe, control maybe things. Maybe it's releasing into the bloodstream in in a longer period of time. So now I, you know, I don't just use up the pain medication and then my body's burnt it out. Right. Right. Now that yeah. pain medication is constantly being dumped right. into my bloodstream and giving me that therapeutic effect because yeah. we're hitting the therapeutic index. And now I'm good to go, right? Mm-hmm. So using this as an example, though, th- this directly affects you know absorption versus excretion. How how well our body absorbs a medication? Because if I give something orally, the absorption process, the digestive process, is going to wear down that medication, and eventually a fraction of what I gave you is going to get into the bloodstream, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Same thing with IM. If I give something intramuscularly, I inject it into you, it's going to burn through these tissues. Eventually, only a little bit, a fraction of that is going to get to my blood vessels to circulate to right. where they need to go. And this is why this answers that question I kind of brought up at the beginning that, that kind of turned me on to this topic is this is why we give such smaller concentrations a lot of times of medications into an IV because it's 100% what we call bioavailable. Mm-hmm. All mm-hmm. of it is available to our body right then and there. If I'm giving an IM medication like epinephrine, I'm going to give one to 1,000 instead of one to 10,000, a much higher concentration, more of that medication in that in that fluid in that dose. because it's going to lose tons and tons of it. And guess what? By the time it gets to the vessels, it's going to be about one to 10,000 concentration mm-hmm. and it's going to be where, where we need to be, right? So lots of factors come into play here. And how the body absorbs well, saying, sometimes it, we, how it excretes it. And sometimes we want that, right? So some medications have to go through the liver and the kidney to be changed in a way where they will then be effective. Mm -hmm. There are some medications that I can't give through an IV because Mm -hmm. in their form, they're not going to have the effect I want, or they may be toxic through an IV. If I, if I put it right into the bloodstream, maybe that's like I said, in that formulation, it's not going to work. I need the digestive system, the liver, the kidney. These are two big filtering, the augmenting uh, organs are going to be your liver and your kidneys. I want it to pass through those organs to be changed in a certain way. So that then has its effect. So this brings up an interesting point, too. I've got a patient who's in kidney failure or who has issues with their liver. Mm -hmm. Well, now I'm, you know, a doctor would then have to look at that and say, you know what? Some of these medications, they're not going to be effectively used through the oral route if they if they're involved in that kidney metabolism stuff. I might need to give it in a faster route or somewhere where I get it right to the tissues because they're not going to make it there because I have failure and things like that. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot to consider with this. And it's kind of interesting stuff. Another thing, too, is that you'll see certain medications that say like EC. And that's like enteric coated. And those medications are literally specifically meant for the stomach to digest them. You want the stomach to di- digest this outer layer before the medication. So like mm-hmm. we said, we, we this is all kind of comes into play of why we use certain medications in certain ways. And I think that goes to, and maybe you're about to jump on it, um, but talking about the first pass effect. Mm-hmm. So that's another thing too. There, there, this, the, this concept that you're describing where like I take medications orally or through the IM and it goes, passes through my liver and my kidneys and some of it is excreted and I don't, that doesn't have a, an effect and some of it is then used. That's called the first pass effect. So the, fir- the first pass first of pass that medication. Metabolism, and right? like the second pass would be the w- when it gets into my bloodstream and then passes through it, it as, you know, in a blood. So you get like a second pass, third pass, fourth pass as blood circulates. The first pass effect is the first time it goes through the liver and the kidney and some of it is excreted and never actually used for its desired effect. Right. And that's very normal. So again, that goes back to dosing and that loading dose versus yeah. maintenance doses, yeah. right? So like, yeah. if we bring this back to basics and we talk about how this is going to apply to us in the field, this is why sometimes we give a lot more of a medication off the bat. And then when they get to the hospital, when they, when they get to the hospital, you're giving sure. them less of that medication as a maintenance dose, right? Mm-hmm. So if I want the therapeutic amount of Jason's disco wafers, I'm going to keep coming back to these. I if I it. want it to be, you know, five to 10, I might have to give 20 off the bat because I'm giving it IM or I'm giving it orally, right? And it takes time. That first metabolism effect takes place. The first pass effect takes place. We lose half of it, right? Mm -hmm. So then we're down to 10. And then eventually that becomes vial available. But now I want to make sure I keep that amount in the bloodstream constantly for a long period of time. Now I give maintenance doses, Mm -hmm. right? So sometimes we give this initial loading dose, this large amount of medication, because it's going to get broken down to get the uh, the influx of medication right, right. into the blood vessels to be consistent. And then we give little maintenance doses to keep that up mm-hmm. because eventually your body will excrete all of it. So we want to try to get our input 
to yeah. be equal our output and, as our therapy. And that's why we do that, and because of that first pass effect of medications. Yeah. And all medications have some kind of first pass effect, you know, some more than others. Like I said, there are some medications that a lot of it is lost the first time it passes through, and some of it not so much. And it depends on, you know, like I said again, how the liver. And then there are medications that are metabolized and excreted through the liver and some that are done that in the kidneys and that just is a function of the liver and kidneys and which medications they're going to essentially do something with you know if that makes sense but so interesting stuff and what this topic is called is pharmacokinetics okay it's it's how a medication moves through the body from absorption to excretion pharmacokinetics when we think kinesiology kinesthetic learner it's when you're a hands-on learner right kinesiology is the study of usually muscle movement connects right? yeah connects like like, right? like you mean like connects? yeah right do they even make connects anymore? i don't know but does, those things I, are the best but yeah that you, makes sense no i think that's because they connect to things not because it's movement Oh, but but you're moving. It's kind of a <laughs> <laughs> anyway. We're confusing our know. audience here. Kinesiology, right, kinetics. When we talk about kinetic energy, it's the it's energy in motion, right? Mm-hmm. We're talking mm-hmm. about movement. So mm-hmm. if I have pharmacokinetics, I'm talking about the movement of a medication through the body from mm-hmm. absorption to excretion and how it works. Well, and that goes back to the other main concept we want to talk about. So there's pharmacokinetics and then there's pharmacodynamics, right? And like I said, if you open up a textbook, both of these concepts are going to be in there. So we want to talk about pharmacodynamics as well. Pharmacokinetics is what your body is doing with the drug. Pharmacodynamics is basically what the drug is doing to your body. All right? Oh, I love that. That's good, right? Say that again. Okay. Again? Mm -hmm. Okay. Pharmacokinetics is what your body... You're having trouble. Say it again, but slower. (laughs) Slower, sexier. Say it again. No, I don't like how this is going. Pharmacokinetics is what your body does with the medication. Right. That's how your body right. uses it. And pharmacodynamics is what, like, mechanism of action, what the drug is doing to the body. To get that effect. effect. Exactly. Right. Cool. So there's three main ways that a drug will have its effect on the body. Either it's going to bind to a receptor, it's going to bind to an enzyme and trigger yeah. a cascade of events to happen in the body. Or it's not going to do either of those things, in which case we say that it is a non-specific, non-specific drug interaction basically right. um can you give an example of like a non-specific yeah. so drug like interaction? so like activated charcoal something like like activated sure. charcoal is a non-specific when we give activated charcoal we just like give this nasty inky black stuff to somebody <laughs> right. and then it like it absorbs bad stuff in the stomach and then you you poo it out like it that, that's the point of it it doesn't act on a receptor it doesn't act on an enzyme it's just like an object that is making mm-hmm. absorb so we call it non-specific that falls within that category another example would be like certain medications that we deal with with like that are like radioactive and stuff to like use radiation to act on areas with cancer patients sure. and stuff like that would be a non-specific drug interaction, not binding to a receptor, not doing what the body already does. Right. Right. Yeah. Not bonding with a binding with an enzyme or, or creating a chain of events, just yeah. doing something to the body outside of that. And that what you just said there, that goes back to, again, we, we talked about this in another lecture or another podcast where we talked about everything we do in medicine in general, not just emergency medicine and EMS, but everything we do in medicine is to augment and in, in, in in some way, shape, or form, what the body is already doing or not doing, right? right. So the same things go with medications. The, so if, a, if it binds to an enzyme or receptor, these enzymes and these receptors are being bound to and changed by our hormones, by dopamine, epinephrine in the body, by you know other chemicals that are just in our body anyway. So medications, again, we're, we're augmenting these things. Right, we already have the receptor, right? right. Yeah. So for an example, if, if we're talking about a drug-receptor interaction, let's say we have a receptor. We'll just call it receptor J. Receptor J, it it makes your heart go faster. Okay? When, when it's, it's turned, turned on, on. When it's turned on, it makes your heart go faster. Okay. So two types of medications I could give. I could give an agonist mm-hmm. or I could give an antagonist. And again, both of these probably already exist in my body and act on this receptor, right. but I'm giving more or less, right? So if I give an agonist and that binds to receptor J, that's going to turn it on and increase my heart rate, right. right? Right. If I give an antagonist, it's going to bind to it, but block off anybody else from being able to bind to it. And it essentially then- Turns it off. Turning it off, yeah. right? It's not- it's not basically turning up the volume or down the volume on, on a, like a spectrum. It's turning a light switch off or on, right? Mm-hmm. It's the ability mm-hmm. for it to activate or not activate it at all. 
Right. So that's agonists versus antagonists. And this makes sense. This is easy to remember. Agonist, agony, we're turning things on, right? Antagonist, someone's antagonizing you, right? They're undoing stuff, yeah. right? So yeah. don't give it a negative connotation because sometimes ag- antagonists are great because we're trying right. to yeah. slow yeah. things down. We might be slowing thing- We might be slowing the heart rate down by preventing the heart rate from being able to increase. And that's yeah. what's so yeah. interesting about this is certain medications do the same things, but they're Agonist versus antagonist. I'll give you an example. Albuterol is going to be an agonist. It, it amps up that dilation effect, right? Atrovent, which we give with albuterol light, is an antagonist. It prevents turning on of the constriction of the airways. Mm-hmm. So both are, are acting through opposite mechanisms, but they're doing the same thing. We're getting the same desired effects. The airway's open. Well, that's the thing, too. So you, you, you know, this might get a little too complicated here, but we won't spend too much time on it. But like I said, you can have, you, 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 most likely have two receptors in a lot of cases you have one that turns things up and one that turns things down so you can you can have an agonist or an antagonist for both of those things having opposite effects right. depending on how you're using the medication it's cool stuff right. yeah. yeah so there's two ways that and this again we, we talked about there's three main ways there's drug receptor interactions there's drug enzyme, enzyme you know reactions and the non-specific so st- sticking with the drug receptor there's, That's what we mostly deal with in, in medicine, yeah. in, at least in, from my experience. In emergency medicine, we're mostly using with using drug receptor right. agonists or antagonists. And some so. of that is because of going back to the onset, right? If you think about it, for and this is kind of a generalization, so don't take but something that if I can turn receptors on and off, I'm going to have effects more quickly than if I have to trigger an enzyme reaction for happening. Right. So medications we use in an, in an emergency situation are – are more than likely going to be drug receptor type interactions. So again, you can have, so you've got the agonist and the antagonist, and we understand that. You can have competitive and non-competitive, um, basically like- Of me- either of those. Of either really? of those. Yeah. So you can have an agonist that's competitive or, or non-competitive. You can have an antagonist that's competitive or non-competitive. What that means is we said that, you know, receptor J, the one you were talking about, right? It gets bound to something and it basically turns it on. What it's getting bound with, again, could be maybe it's dopamine, maybe it's epinephrine, something in our body that already exists. A competitive medication is going to bind to that same spot that that normal one does. It competes with that hormone or whatever already binds there. It competes with it for that spot. A non-competitive, it just doesn't even go to that spot. It goes to a different spot on the uh, receptor to turn it on or off, essentially. Mm-hmm. So, like, so competitive means it's trying to bind to that same spot that's normally bound by our body. Non-competitive means it binds to a whole different site. Um, and then there, on top of that, is a reversible and irreversible. So a reversible medication is one where um, something can knock it off once it binds on that receptor. And you know, rever- irreversible would be that once it's bound, it has to essentially use up its effects before it will depart. It can't be knocked off yeah. by something And else. usually if you can give a reversal a reversal agent, right? So right. if I can give Narcan to right. undo fentanyl, well, then I know the fentanyl is working in a, a competitive agonist right. reversible way. Right. Right? Yeah, so yeah, so yeah, it, yeah. it gets complicated when you get into right. the details. But I always thought when I was going through school, I always to try to kind of understand the competitive thing. I saw that as like more troops, right? I'm giving more of the thing in my body that turns it on, and then that's going to beat out the things that turn it off because mm-hmm. we have both in our body, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So competitive, I want to beat that competition. I'm adding more players to my field, right? Yeah. More players yeah. on my team versus non-competitive. It's just a separate thing. You're playing a whole different game. Yeah, right, right, right. exactly, exactly. So, so yeah, so, so some nuance, you know, you know, things here, but like I said, it, it, where it gets complicated, always got complicated for me was the agonist antagonist turning on and off. But then trying to figure out if the receptor increases or decreases certain right. things. That's where it starts you, to get kind of You tend like, to think like, oh, all agonists must amp things up. And right, that's not yeah, the case. You yeah. can have an agonist that actually turns things yeah, down. Yeah, you have a receptor that slows the heart rate down. Or you have a receptor that stops things from happening. And you ag- you put an agonist on it. It will increase stopping the thing from right. happening. You know, which is just, yeah. like, it's kind of – But again, these are the topics that you need to understand and learn. Because, again, once you understand this stuff, just like with everything, when we take it back to basics like this – it starts to make a lot more sense why you use certain medications for certain things. Why you why use you, certain routes. Why you, Yeah, why you use certain routes, why you use certain dosage. I mean, this is all what is – now when you go and approach medications and flashcards one at one, you can really start to better understand how this all works. Right. Cha- I get to chapter two now, and I'm going beta agonist 
medications. Okay, I'm, I'm looking at albuterol. I'm looking at epinephrine. I'm looking yeah. at these so things. So you ask, like, now what do I, beta receptors do? If, right. I, if I give an agonist, how do I stimulate those? And start, it starts Turns to them on. Start what's to... the body's effect of that? And then you can even go deeper into there are certain drugs that just activate that beta receptor, and there's certain drugs that activate that beta receptor and do other things as side effects. Mm-hmm. I need to remember what those things do, right? Yeah. So know your drug. That it's, It is important yeah. to know the drugs you're going to deal with. But if you come at it with a base understanding of pharmacology in general, it's going to be a lot easier to kind of digest that information and be prepared for interactions in the field and adverse effects and side effects and know what your drug's doing yeah. and know how to how to fix that and how to use it to your patient's uh, best interest. Yeah, definitely. So, all right, well, two things before we end here. I've got two things. One is what's your favorite drug to give in EMS? I just want to know what your favorite, what is My your favorite, favorite drug, drug to give? Answer carefully. This is being recorded. Okay. Um, fluid. <laughs> fluid? <laughs> no, I, just, I, I, you know, I like drugs that like definitely, so I like adenosine. Okay. Okay. Right. Because adenosine is one of those drugs that I feel like you can give it the wrong way and it doesn't work and you can mm-hmm. give it the right way and it does work. Like if you know about adenosine, like you know these concepts, you know adenosine yeah. has like a short half-life, so you got to give it fast, right? You got to get fluid behind mm-hmm, it, right? Mm-hmm. And it has like drastic effects on the patient. Yeah. And it kind of like everyone holds their breath and like the patient flatlines for a second and then it kicks in. So like I don't give it a ton. It's not like we deal with like yeah. unstable tachycardias or even stable tachycardias that we need to like act on a whole lot. But when we do, I think it's you fun. Like that it has that effect, yeah. I like that it's cool. Yeah. yeah. My favorite is insulin. And this is why giving insulin is just kind of boring, but I want to, I want to share this because this is super cool. I was reading about, and this is like, as a doctor, there's not many things that we give or do, um, like experimentally anymore. They have, but I was reading this article about when insulin first came out. Right. So this is a true story. So there was like this, this like whole floor of children who basically had type 1 diabetes, but people didn't know what type 1 diabetes was back then. Mm -hmm. There's this whole floor of children, and their parents are all sitting at their bedside, and they're all, like, in comas, right? And they're all dying. Like, it's like the sugar disease. Like, they're they're just going to die. And they decided to, for the first time they've been developed, they decided to test insulin. And they walked into this floor and started giving insulin, and just every single child started to wake up. And that is crazy to me that, like, like, like we don't, you know, in in my, maybe in my lifetime, we'll we'll, we'll find a drug that does that. that But, like, that is insane to me to think that like it, like what a miracle it would have seemed like to like have discovered this medication that just right. all of a sudden all these kids who are just, I don't know that's crazy to me so that's, that's why cool. insulin's my favorite and I drug. think yeah I think we we lean towards medications that like have big differences and like yeah. significant effects because it right. makes us feel like we're doing that right yeah right? yeah because exactly. we so. like being gods well you know, no, I like to have not, full control no, no, over. No, no, no. Nope. You can close this out. Okay. So. All right. Anyway. Second thing I wanted to share, guys, is that we're talking about pharmacology. We do have, if you're a paramedic or you're an EMT going to paramedic, you're getting ready for your exam, we have free pharmacology flashcards for all the drugs that could show up on the National Registry exam. All right. So there's a list of drugs on the NREMT website that you need to know for your exam. We've got them. We've made flashcards for you. We would love to e- email them to you. Again, they are free. You can, two ways you can get them. You can email us at training at sightsandsirens.com. Or you can join our, face, our Facebook group, NREMT Daily Practice Questions. When you join on there, put your email in. We'll send them to you for free. And again, that Facebook group, NREMT Daily Practice Questions, every day you're going to get free practice questions. Just push through that Facebook group. It's also a nice supportive network for people who are studying for their exam. So go ahead and join us there, um, and we'd love to, to interact with you even more. So thank you guys so much. Hopefully this kind of said we gives you a good overview of pharmacology from a base standpoint so you can now take this and start to apply it and see why you're doing certain things in the field so hope you guys have a good week and we will see you next time stay sweet hey guys hope you enjoyed the episode if you're an emt or medic student or an advanced emt student or an instructor of those students we have a program just for you with sights and sirens nremt prep program you get video lectures over 15 hours of really vetted great content to help you through your program and help you prepare for the test check it out at www.sightsandsirens.com